Hello and welcome to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast coming to you from Vitality Stadium. We're here to bring you closer to some of the personalities connected to the club, from players to staff and fans. For those of you who haven't tuned in before, my name is Zoe Rundle and I'm part of the media team here at AFC Bournemouth. I'm absolutely delighted to say that my colleague Neil Perrett is alongside me once again. He's going to help lead us through the next hour. Neil, it's great to see you. Great to see you too, Zoe. Now, Neil, we often talk about you as Mr Bournemouth, but our guest today could certainly rival you for that title. Our current academy manager, a former youth team manager and even a brief spell as the club's caretaker manager. We're absolutely delighted to welcome Joe Roach onto the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. Thanks for joining us, Joe. Yeah, good morning, Zoe. Good morning, Neil. Well, Joe, we've got plenty to get our teeth stuck into and we want to make sure we get through it all. Now, before we get into the finer detail, can you just start by explaining the category structure to us? There's nothing like a, an easy question to start with. Yeah, the uh, Elite Player Performance Plan um, basically is built around academies and academies are categorised as Category 1, Category 2, Category 3 and Category 4, with each of those categories having certain requirements in place. I believe and we believe as a club that we are operating as a Category 2 currently. Uh, training ground is in place in terms of the facilities we've currently got. Staff levels are above Category 2 levels and in some instances maybe even on the verge of Category 1. Um, we've got a budget to support uh, the categories as we are at the moment and certainly Category 2. Um, the one thing that unfortunately we haven't got access to at the moment and there's nowhere in the conurbation has it is an in indoor facility. And what benefits would there be to, you know, being a Category 1 or, or Category 2 team? Obviously, you, you play in slightly different divisions and, and play different teams. Uh, yeah, I mean, I suppose the blunt answer to that question is the games programme. The games programme for all age groups, to development squad down to 18s, all the way down to under 9s, will be uh, completely shift across to a more competitive environment, more tour opportunities, tournament opportunities against... You know, Southampton's, Arsenal's, Charlton's, QPR's. Um, no disrespect to the Category 3 uh, programme at all, but that would uh, take us to certainly the next stage of the programme we would require to continue to improve our players. Joe, um, what are the drawbacks of being Category 3? I remember I spoke to Alan Connell. I think they won the league and, as you say, no disrespect to Category 3, but they almost felt like they were playing in a, in a field or something, something like that. So what, what would you say the drawbacks are? I think some of the drawbacks are the, you know, the, the sort of league that the club is in, uh, the financial capacity for that club to support uh, an academy programme, and then obviously having the access to the facilities that they would probably like at their level. You know, there are some really good um, Category 3 academies, and, and in our environment there are. People work tirelessly um, to develop players in, in the environment they're in. It is what it is, a little bit like ourselves years and years ago. Um, and then obviously, if we're looking to encourage um, players to, who have been released from Cat 1s to come to us, you know, would they want to come to a Cat 3? So we have to try and portray ourselves and uh, get a commitment from the family and if they've got an agent or representative um, to buy into what we do. So we have to almost sell ourselves to try and make sure that a Category 1 player, for example, doesn't decide to go to a Category 2 purely because the games programme is better. Uh, it is about the games programme. It's also about making sure that we nurture and support uh, the players when they're with us, whether we're a Category 3 or 1. And that's an internal thing, an internal mechanism. Just to sort of confirm, just because you're in the Premier League doesn't mean that you're Category 1. And just because you're in League 2 doesn't mean that you're Category 4. It doesn't work like that. So if you get relegated or promoted, you don't doesn't change your category. No, the only, the only way you would lose your category, which hasn't, hasn't happened yet, is if you're not achieving the standards that the audit team require uh, or you financially can't uh, I mean obviously there are clubs who've been category one who've gone to a category two and there are clubs who've been category two uh, you know a club in for example has gone into a B team operation so they've come out of the category program um, and one could stay in a category four um, and have a you know another level of competition for those uh, older players so it's probably trying to work out was what is bespoke for you. But in essence, the majority of Cat 1s are in the Premier League and the Championship. Obviously, you know a great deal about this, Joe, not just in your role here. You mentioned the audit team there, didn't you? Now, 
you've had some experience of working on that audit team, so you know exactly what's required. Yeah, I, I was fortunate to, um, when I left here in 2011, um, after a brief spell of uh, trying to seek employment, uh, I was fortunate enough to g- <coughs> gain access to uh, Double Pass, which is a Belgian company that uh, uh, audited the German leagues and they've audited other sports like handball, uh, the Premier League, uh, and Double Pass came together and uh, they drove the elite player performance plan from the outset. Uh, best CPD I've ever done, uh, best insight to clubs. Uh, I was fortunate to go into clubs for four days initially, um, look at all the training, look at all the games, look at the sports science program, education program, uh, interview all those staff, uh, interview the players, speak to the manager about the philosophy, um, speak to the CEO about investment, budgets, uh, the sort of uh, culture of the club, the vision of the club. I did approximately 25 clubs, four days, and then we did um, revisits for uh, either reassessments or uh, reports. Um, so there was obviously then one or two days uh, attached to different clubs uh, uh, who attain in different levels. Um, so it gave me a real deep insight into the running of a Cat 1. And uh, Cat 4s then um, weren't orders, uh, but certainly looking at Cat 3s and look at the, the work that was being done. And there was some unbelievable work being done in some Cat 3s. Um, so 100% I'm not to, trying to come across as being critical to the environment, the category you were in. Um, because as you can imagine, with less staff, you have to do more. And some of those staff are under duress trying to produce players and with the limited facilities we've got or budget. But going back to the point you make, the opportunity for me to sort of have access to that was, you know, the best probably period of time I've had. And I'd like to think I've come back from that into this club and implemented some of the things I've seen. Uh, certainly challenge um, the board to try and ensure we're supported in the areas I mentioned earlier to Zoe. And, uh, you know, the board have come up with the goods, you know, the budget, uh, supporting the training grounds, certainly supporting the staff levels. And there's been no question of uh, the support, their support in that regard. And I would obviously always want to, and as anyone in my job would want to do, is, is strive to continue to develop and probe and press. And, you know, the indoor is obviously, like we said before, Zoe, uh, is the one thing that uh, uh, we need to get in place. Uh, some clubs are very fortunate there are indoor facilities in their demographic and they can access it, you know, without having to stump up three quarters of a million or 1.2 million pound, whatever it might cost. We're not that fortunate. Um, but uh, you know, we're, we're going in that direction now. We're in conversations with um, a couple of things at the moment, which hopefully will, will get us over that line in, in the not too distant future. Tell us how the dynamic works between you... Alan Connell, the under-18 manager, Sean Cooper, the under-21 manager. Just, just tell us how it all works. Well, we all know each other. Um, you know, the one thing in terms of the staff levels we were bereft of a little bit. Um, we had some fantastic part-time staff working for us. Lots of volunteers. We had, I think I did an analysis a while back, 289 people come through the door, which doesn't provide continuity to players. So... The one they had to do is try and make sure that we could look at the people we've got inside the club um, and certainly the ex-players' experience of playing for the club and people like Alan, Sean, uh, Warren, Gaz Stewart, Mark Mosley, you know, were exceptional people. So going back to the point you made, it's very easy to have a discussion with people you know well. Um, we're very much on the same track, trying to go in the same direction. Um, I'll use my experience to try and assist them, um, you know, with Alan every 18's game. Um, and they've all done terrific jobs. And we've also got other people that are coaches who are, are, are developers. So they're being supported by other people than me. So I think it's a really good fix. I think it's a fantastic environment. You know, we get talk about the culture and everything else. We get complimented from the Premier League and the EFL about this environment and the staff, of which there are many. But those, those individuals who mentioned do a fantastic job. We're tirelessly for the the benefit of the players and the support by excellent staff. So I'm really fortunate, A, to have a relationship and to also have people that are fully focused on their job and not fixated on where am I going next. While we're on the subject of those coaches, we obviously have a lot of former players that are on the coaching team 
within the academy just tell us about the rationale of bringing them on board and you know having their connections to the club and, and what it can help the youngsters for well going back to going back to the audit the one of the audit points i said before is about you know the culture and the philosophy and values and everything else and if you don't have individuals in the workplace that uh, have those or embody those or carry those things through then obviously you're gonna have a bit of a problem i think being around the first team as i have fortunately i've been around those players um quite often um going back to the point you make when we looked at progressing as a as an academy we looked at how we can negate the sort of ins and outs of various numbers of staff because players were getting different messages every other season or every season so we we had a technical board meeting um at that time with um with ed jason uh steve purchase neil uh, richard hughes uh, from a recruitment point of view and we talked about how we can improve what we've got and uh the difficulty at the time was a lot of the people you mentioned were still playing. I'd sort of come out of the top end of football and were playing, um, you know, the likes of Pool Town, etc. So it was coaxing them out of that environment because each of them started part time. You know, Alan coming up in the under 12s, Mark Mosey, for example, coming up in the under 15s. You know, they didn't walk straight into a full time job because it was important they understood the rigours of the job and they started building up almost a toolbox of skills that can enable them to work at uh, the level we wanted to go into. Um, so we had an agreement that we would look at employing um, or developing ex-players and those ex-players that we felt had the, the skills, the mentality, the sort of the humble um, side to them, um, but also understood the club well. So uh, again, you know, that was going to come at a cost for the club and, and we did that. And I think at one point, including the first team staff I just mentioned, we had 24 ex-players um, in the club involved in you know either the first team or development squad or academy uh, and added to that within that 24 we had some players like um, I'll mention Elliot head for one who got released to 15 went and worked for the FA and he's one of these developers that I mentioned before who supported Alan and um, and Sean and, and Mark and and currently does that with Warren as does with Bruce Rassi, who's the head of coaching, who was you know, coaching somewhere else. So it hasn't just all been about the first-team players, it's about educating those players, because clearly they're educated how to play the game, but coaching academy players and everything that we need to be doing is quite demanding. You know, Warren uh, has come in. I, I asked Warren some time ago in his Bristol City, did, did he want to come into the academy to coach? Because I saw him in the first-team change room, listened to him. He's certainly very knowledgeable, but he said, no, no, I'm going to stay with recruitment. And he realised Alan... And um, Sean uh, were, were getting to grasp with the job in hand and were loving it. And, uh, you know, he jumped at it, found it difficult in the first uh, year or so. And he loves it. And I think if you would speak to all of those guys, they absolutely love their job. And, and that was important, making sure we got the right people in, not people that were coming in for five minutes to jump to the first team. Um, and I'm delighted with, you know, the way that's gone. Uh, there's not many clubs that can probably sit there and say we've got that many ex-players at different levels and I must emphasise it's not been all about the players who finished playing professional football we've got probably about five young players now who've not been successful again in a professional contract uh, but they did the coaching course uh, while they were us and they've utilised that to then develop their coaching skills and they're working with us now part time so actually you know it's a uh, very bright, a vibrant environment with people that know each other quite well. Very healthy. Is that one of the real positives about coaching? You know, you, could, you can take people who have such a knowledge of the game and they can apply their skill in a different way. And I mean, you mentioned Warren there, you saw him in the, the change room. He often had this sort of joker sort of side to him. And, you know, now he's out there and, and he's a brilliant coach. And again, he's turned his knowledge of football and passing that on to the next generation. And I guess that's, that's what's going to happen to those who haven't quite been good enough to make it and you know now we're going to be out there on the coaching field well Warren hasn't lost any any of his sense of humor and um, which actually is great um, and I think the, the important thing for me was taking the opportunity you know for example Sean come up to watch a game uh, an academy game because Alan was coaching it and you engaged with him and I knew him anyway he was you know very quiet uh, in the change room he did his business on the pitch but you listen to him talk and you engage in a conversation, you start working out the depth of knowledge he has that he can, he can apply. Not every player uh, can suddenly transfer that experience into coaching. 
uh, and I'm not going to name, you know, there's been some unbelievable players who play the very, very top, you know, would find it hard to transfer that that's either skill set or mindset or whatever else it is. You know, they can't go in and say, this is how I played, this is what I want you to do, because they've got 18 young players all playing different positions with different attributes. So you need to find the right person at the right time and place them in the right environment. Um, and that's where, that's where we've been very, very fortunate. And I think having known those players for a long time, there's no doubt looking at them in the change room, looking at them on the pitch, the humility and respect and, and hard work was transferable. It was just making sure they understood how young academy players tick. So many coaches that we could mention, but Sean Cooper, our under-21s manager, Alan Connor, our under-18s manager, you must be absolutely delighted with the impact that they've had and that they continue to have. No, they you know they know each other well, so they trust each other. Um, and I say they've integrated with the staff. You know, it's not just about the coaches. I must emphasise that. You know, they're supported by, and I, I don't want to mention every person because I would not want to miss anybody. But from a departmental point of view, they're supported by, you know, an unbelievable sports science program. Um, you know, the medical program, uh, the recruitment program to support the players coming in. And the education and player care, every department is functioning in a way that supports those two guys. And I'm really pleased that, and it's not about results. The result is about putting people out on there in front of the manager. But those players have gone out on the training ground under the managers and every one of them's done well. And that's a testament to the work that's been done from when they've come into the academy all the way through to Alan, Sean, and then across to now the current management team. Joe, you mentioned Richard Hughes earlier, just explain how the dynamic works with you and Richard and you and Simon Francis now I would imagine as well I just had a conversation with Simon this morning because obviously he's not been in the building that long so we obviously want to utilise his energy and enthusiasm um, and I spoke to him today and he's you know, really enthusiastic about the job um, I've just explained to him some of the, the background details are on the same page you know same with Richard um, you know we've got a technical board meeting that we have periodically but within that we also because it's hard to get all the main people around the table at the same time so I'll have incidental conversations with Richard about various things ranging from you know development to how we can sort of develop the training ground and obviously that's in collaboration with Neil Simon's on board now so hopefully that can lift a bit of uh, the pressure away from what Richard is doing on a day-to-day -day basis and hopefully Simon can support me uh, and the academy uh, look at the way we can progress um, and obviously I've known Richard for a, a long time as a player uh, and obviously Simon so it's another another sort of golden nugget really that you wouldn't want to turn down um, I'm just probably the fly in the equipment sometimes always once, 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 once but you know that's my job um, and you know I can be more supported by the individuals around me We know Richard and Simon and the recruitment team are responsible for the first team finding players, etc. Would it be that they would ever sort of give you a, a, a 15, 16 year old lad and say, we, he, does that, do they do that as well? Or you, you, you've got your own recruitment team as well? Well, we, we've got, you know, one of the things that we were bereft of when I came here uh, from the onset was, was recruitment. You know, we had volunteers doing the work, which were, you know, brilliant, no money. And uh, we progressed from that when I came back. Uh, and again, because of the audit process, it was important. We, we were able to get ahead of recruitment in. Carl Robson, who you know did a remar remarkable job in the time he's here, and you, you've got Carl Fletcher. Obviously, we, we shouldn't forget who was doing the, the 23s at the time, and now he's loan manager. So he will drip players in that he, uh, you know, he's going around different clubs looking for loans for us. But people will obviously drop players in his ear. Um, we've had players come from him. We've had players coming from Richard. I'm sure, you know, Simon's got his feet on the table. We'll look at players, but. We obviously then have to look at our own academy players as well, because that's what we're investing in. So those conversations need to be in line, uh, because everyone's given us players. You know, we've been well established in the Premier League. We're a good, good name for ourselves in the game. We produce players, but we've got to make sure we pick the right individuals, um, and it's not volume. So yeah, we'll have we'll have players coming from different different uh, people at different times for sure. And I say I was speaking to Simon today about. I think Alan and Sean were on the phone this morning talking about you know, how we can get some more players in the under-21s to be looked at. We've only got about an hour, Joe, and I know that the next question you could probably speak for days on end about this, but it's not just playing football with these young lads. They don't just come along 
train for a few hours and then that's it. There's a lot more going on. I'm looking at education. I'm looking at teaching them to coach people. And you even have referees coming in, teaching them to to referee, I believe, just sort of expand on on the the day in the life of, if you like. Yeah, we've got, um, I think, going back to the earlier point so we can link together, if we're looking at, you know, for example, we'll use Jaden Anthony at the moment, getting released by Arsenal. And his agent or his family, even looking at AFC Bournemouth, is a plus. He's got other options. So the most important thing is we're honest and we tell him what we can provide. Um, he's in the environment. I think they would see the environment as being a healthy environment. Um, and then we have to come up with the goods. So we need to be totally transparent, totally honest about what we can provide at our level. Um, so the education programme for every parent is important because the drop-off rate at the end is quite um, fast. Um, so we can say categorically that you know our education programme, we've had 100% completion of the programme over the last five years, which is incredible. Um, so that gives you you know facts that you can give to a future player who's coming in as fa- family. Uh, on top of that, they do the referee coaching qualification I mentioned before. Uh, we've got Darren Can coming in on Monday at Brockenhurst College and uh, Mr. Scott. Um, we had uh, Andre Mariner and um, uh, Mr. Can come in for a number of years and, and they were you know, so complimentary about this. In fact, they wrote us an email saying the best group of players we've ever had in all the time we've been here. So we get Premier League referees come in to provide them with the uh, referees qualification twofold really so they understood they understand the officials on a match day and understand a little bit of the duress that they're under sometimes they understand the laws of the game um, so it's a learning process as well and then we do personal trainer qualifications uh, at some time in that program you know uh, I'll use Jamie Wiskin as an example who you know play for the first team on one occasion now he's got his own private uh, personal training company doing very well playing for Pool Town so at the time they come in, they're not really looking at what happens in X amount of years of not here, but we have to provide them with the tools that they may need in life at some stage. Um, and I think that's so important. Brockenes College, the provider, we've been here since 2002. So, you know, they're tutored from, they go to, back to the college now. Uh, and the tutors are all engaged with the tutors for a long time. Um, so, yes we can say categorically that they will have a good education experience while here. Now, I'm going to ask you to cast your mind back 20 years when you first came here. I think Sean O'Driscoll appointed you. Now, I know that Sean had been the youth team manager prior to that, and I was also aware that the youth department or the youth team, whatever, was temporarily scrapped for for cost-cutting reasons, so there was no youth team for a period of time. Just tell us about that department or the area that you walked into 20 years ago, Joe. Uh, well, the ground was getting knocked down. I was in a porter cabin. Um, Sean sold me a dream, <laughs> or I sold him one. Um, but no, he was, um, I have to say, uh, he, he was brilliant. I mean, I was running a, a programme on the Isle of Wight Newport College football education programme uh, with Tony Mount, Mason Mount's dad at the time. So I think he got he got wind of me running that program. Um, he'd also had a member of his community staff on a coaching course, which I run, and I think he spoke quite highly of me uh, during his time at the course. So Sean approached me um, at the time. I had an offer from Southampton, um, which I didn't accept uh, for a, a particular reason, and uh, he invited me in, told me what had gone on. You know, they didn't have a youth team. The centre of excellence was sort of operating, but it was at a level. Um, and he said, look, we need to get this back on track. Uh, what can you do? I said, uh, well, I've got some ideas. I'm obviously doing a programme. I said, I'll look at Brockenhurst College as an example, because they had uh, training fields, whereas Bournemouth Pool didn't. It was on a train line link. So anyone we recruited slightly out of area, they could come in. We didn't have a budget, so the players didn't get paid. 
There was no accommodation. There was no travel costs. So they were coming in under their own steam. There was no, they had to get their own medical insurance. So we had boys traveling on that train from London, dropping off at Brockenhurst. So I'm looking at it all and going, right, okay. Um, my contract at the time had five jobs. I was head of youth, youth team manager, education officer, recruitment, and sex, center of excellence manager. So on top of trying to put the youth team back in place some way, somehow, with a limited budget, I have to say, it was then how do I run this? So I had to pri try and prioritize, firstly, the conversation with Brockenhurst College, would they buy into it? And they were, Neil Flanagan at the time uh, was the link and he was brilliant. He was, yes, but this will be the limitations. And you have to, I suppose this goes back to the education point you make. He said that you have to ensure that these boys attain because the funding will only be there for attainment. We won't get any funding if they don't attain. So it's very important the lads come in with the determined, determination to achieve their qualifications. So it was quite a big task. So the first thing I looked at doing is, right, I need a centre of excellence manager. And uh, I knew a colleague, ex-colleague, Derek Hold, who came in and run that uh, programme for me. The next thing I had to sort of uh, uh, move was the responsibility for the community programme. Um, so I did a, uh, some interviews. I interviewed Steve Cuss, who was at Torquay at the time. So clearly, you know, he had, he had a desire uh, and a commitment to the community side of things, so I brought him in. That alleviated a couple of positions. Um, and then... Uh, recruitment was basically just spread out to volunteers, as I said before. Um, we had a couple of people involved in that early on. You know, Matty Holmes was great at a, a period, which is just some time after that, I think. Um, and then it was getting down to the roots and branches of it, really, was the youth team. So I had to then go through all the contact addresses of the parents and players that had been released at the time. And we had a meeting out on Kings Park on the grass. It was a nice sunny day like this and sort of told them what I uh, believed to be the way forward. And, you know, would they buy into what I'm saying, given the fact that they'd already been with us and then been let go. And I think they, they, they were terrific. Um, we had some firm sort of uh, footprints in the sand in terms of what, what I could say we were definitely going to do. And one of them was getting the programme together at Brockenhurst and the education programme. But these are the deficiencies. Uh, not everybody subscribed, and I ended up running a 17s and a 19 team. So I had about 36 players in the end because the league was 17s and 19s, then. there was no such thing as development squad. And really, it was just hard work, determination, um, not just on my part, you know, other other individuals that wanted to, you know, collaborate and move forward. And you know, and that's where we started. Really, we had one and a half pitches at Brockenest, and that's what we trained on. Uh, we had the use of the gym when it was timetabled away from students. Um, we had limited kit. We had, uh, as you'll probably remember, was it Cherry Shire, whatever it was, or the buckets that were going around. And we, we had a red minibus bought for us by the fans. We had, right, what do you need this time? And it was, oh, can I have 20 footballs? Uh, oh, we need some cones. You know, it was, it was like that, um, from hand to mouth, really. Um, but you know what, it was, it was brilliant because Every week, every month, you saw progression in some way, shape or form. And that's all you want, really. And then me going down coaching was brilliant. Then I had to look at how I can operate a 17s and 9s group. 19s group, sorry, I can't do that by myself. I can't split myself in two. So the college employed uh, a couple of coaches. Uh, so that was brilliant. So I had a couple of uh, good coaches who worked with me. He, uh, Huey and Huey Lewis and Mark Kelly came in and did some work with me there. And I had a part-time physio sports therapist, for want of a better word. Uh, the, uh, what, uh, sorry, uh, Jordan Mooney was one, the first one. And then Kev Berry came in. Um, and later on, Matty Holmes come down. Um, and to be fair to him, he wanted to work with the Littlands. Uh, and I have to compliment on that. He didn't want to get caught up in the under-18s, but he did some really good technical work. And then, you know, I had a, a, a gentleman called Brian O'Donnell who played for the club. Uh, he unfortunately passed away not too long ago. He, he was brilliant. He, he worked with the 16s, uh, worked a lot with Danny Ings, uh, gave me a lot of good feedback on Danny. Um, so I had, you know, different things going on. 
Um, but like I say, I could use the whole hour talking about that period. Um, and then the engagement with Sean and at the time Peter Grant and then Richard O'Kelly. For me, not being involved in coaching in professional football uh, 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 in a full-time capacity, you know, they were fantastic. They, they couldn't have been more open and sharing uh, with me, you know, being on the bench on match days and seeing exactly what it looks like on the ground. It was then easy for me to transfer a lot of the messages that the manager wanted and the system manager and the staff wanted across those guys when I was training them. And at some stage later, I obviously took the reserve team, so I was using the mix of the first team players and, and new team players, which was really good for me. Um, so yeah, it was it was uh, quite a lot of progress in, in a short space of time. Um, and, and we stayed at Brockenhurst College for till 2011. Just talking about Brockenhurst College, I was listening to an interview with um, Matt Tubbs on Radio Solent the other day. He obviously works at Brockenhurst College on the youth on the youth ranks here, and then he went to Bolton on the youth ranks, and then he came back here as a pro. Is he? Does he have any input in our in our groups there? Um, he's obviously got a family now. He's, he's, he, he, he actually chooses our group, um, which is great because he's coming from a football background. Um, interestingly, he came. I'm glad you mentioned him. Actually, he came from Bolton. Uh, he'd gone up there when I think it was when the, the youth team side of things had obviously gone a bit wobbly. And he came back and he, he ended up being in my environment because we had that, I think, it might have been the 17s and 19s at the time or wherever. He, you know, he did come into Brockland as he was in the group and he was fantastic. His attitude, I mean, I used to use him as a sort of role model to the players. You know, this is a lad who's been through this journey. He's been on the edge of not being involved and he's gone to Bolton. Again, another situation where it's not gone the way he wants. He's come back and his attitude, this is what you guys need to be aspiring to. Um, you know, so... Um, he obviously played here, so I knew him from, you know, previously. Um, you know, we have looked at speaking to Matty about coming in and doing some coaching, but obviously at the moment he's doing the job there and he's doing football over there. And obviously his family's developed. Um, but yeah, he, he, he's been in and he's, he's got, again, the same same enthusiasm and, uh, you know, sort of a game intelligence that would, you know, enable him to be a, a, a good coach. For you, obviously, going back to Sean O'Driscoll, his graduates, he's got a great list of graduates here. Eddie Howe, Carl Fletcher, James Hayter, Brian Stock, to name a few. The recruitment, even in those days, was was still quite something. Yeah. I, I, I think I can't say too much about what the recruitment might have looked like then because quite a few of those players were in. Um, but if you're looking at him recruiting, and I'm sure knowing, knowing him, he would have recruited the right people. Um, and I think every one of those players you just rolled off would pay Sean high regard. Um, and a lot of those players who have now in the coaching environment, either here or somewhere else, would say that they've taken the messages that he's given them when they were playing and utilised them as well as they've added to their own their own personal development. Um, but because uh, when I came here, I think Mel, Mel was here, uh, Sean was here. Uh, Mike Cordroy was here, uh, Peter Grant was here at the time, and they obviously had their network of people that would bring players in, but we had, they obviously had the youth program here, which, of, of which Sean was part of, as you mentioned before. So some of those players he would have probably brought through that environment into the first team, and obviously you know, was, had some of those players at Doncaster uh, as an example. So uh, yeah, he would have been a great mentor for those players to where they are now, I'm sure. There was obviously a relegation in 2002 and then the year later there was a promotion. Does that have any bearing on the academy? Does it mean that maybe more players might get a chance in the first team? Does it mean that costs are cut? What, what, does that affect an academy in, in any way? Uh, we have been very fortunate. Uh, Sean was very, very, very much on making sure that the, the academy or the centre of excellence it was then was portrayed within the club. It was the community. It was part of the community from a fan point of view. From a recruitment point of view, um, that that needed to be at the heart uh, of the club. Um, you know, so whilst Sean was here, there was no question, and, and goes back to the the reason why I'm here. You know, his desire to make sure that program was in place was part of the reason why he approached me. Um, you know, there was never a time through all the perils where there was well, one occasion actually when we had to discuss the sort of uh, the purpose 
of the youth team. And at the time, I did a presentation in this very building. And I don't think there were certain individuals there that understood that we had below the youth team, we had a centre of excellence of over 140 boys. Uh, there was a discussion about, you know, the financial um, sort of weight on running, you know, a first team, uh, a club, a centre of excellence and sustaining that. Uh, obviously, the youth team uh, were sort of, sort of not costing to a degree. You know, we didn't have to pay for the facilities, the part-time staff, etc. But when I actually did my presentation, said, right, okay, fine, if this is what we're going to do, who's going to tell the parents of 150 young, per young players and their brothers and sisters that we're thinking about doing this? And then someone went, we got 150 players. Not, we haven't just got 18, 19. I went, no. And this is the time when there was individuals who were supporting, were working in other environments and came together. So it was it was um, it was interesting, and then um, on another occasion, we had the players parade around the uh, the stadium. Um, I think it was towards the end of the season. Every young player, and I, I've mentioned this to Jeff and Steve Sly. We're on the touchline, and I was stood directly behind them, and there was just a conversation about you know how much it costs and things like this and. And the parade of players were going round and it looks like quite a volume of people and the crowd were in applauding them. And I remember Jeff turning around to Steve and going, wow, he said, we've got to carry this forward. Uh, it'd been very, very easy at the time with all the pressures that those guys were under to go, nah, you know, okay, yeah, fine. We need to move on. And so what I'm trying to say is at any stage, at no stage have we or I been in fear of um, you know, removing the program like other clubs have done, uh, and even you know coming out of the Premier League. You know, Neil tasked me with a uh, you know you need to be looking at this. So obviously you start worrying a little bit. But I've given a budget. We've we've trimmed sensible things back, um, and we're going forward. So of course, football's driven by results, promotions, relegations, and you know the business plan has to fit in what, where we are at that given point in time. But in all the twenty years I've been here. I've not been concerned personally about our longevity. Um, it's just me being greedy or selfish to try and get more and more and more and more, which is not always possible. But I can't stop. Uh, if, I, if I stop, it's a point of me being here. It must be very reassuring for you, you know, when you think about the longevity of it, because we've seen in the last few, last few years, Brentford's have sort of made cuts in their academy, Birmingham recently making cuts in their academy for you knowing that there's a backing here and knowing that there's a support here must be, be so reassuring for you and your staff. I think the easiest thing for any club to have done is looked at the impact of the Premier League, the benefits and then the drawbacks and the financial um, input that the, the owner, uh, who obviously is finances, um, can, can speak highly about his commitment and actually continuing that in all the ups and downs. So you're in the Premier League, great, you know, and then suddenly... You're staying relegation in. And it could have been easy to say, well, let's look at a Cat 4, for example. You know, Huddersfield uh, were a Cat 2. Could have been Cat 1, in my opinion, because I did their audit. They had everything in place to be a Cat 1, in my opinion. Um, but they went, you know, another big club. Um, and they removed it because they were getting picked off by bigger clubs. I think the thing here is we're fortunate in some way with recruitment, we mentioned before, is that there's not a a, a raft of clubs, if that's the right word. There's not a number of clubs on our doorstep. We know we've got Southampton, our ne nearest neighbours. Um, and then we've got the sea behind us. Um, and I'm, I like to keep saying, tongue in cheek, we've never recruited a fish. So that's a wasted journey. We've got the new forest on one side. So, But then we can capture our own players. Uh, it's an affluent area, so we need to work really, really hard with our players. You know, They're not inner city um, kids. But these clubs who operate sometimes I have the vision of being a cat one and I said before you know I'm not going to name the club but I think one club particularly went cat four because they were getting fed up of developing players and they were getting picked off you know the compensation that some clubs pay is derisory for the work that they put into them and owners would go what's the point so they'll have a different business model and they'll shift the model to suit themselves um, and that's where you know the categories are great but people should have the capacity to 
um, go in the direction they want. I'm, I'm not, if I've got to be honest, which I want to be, uh, I, I'm not in favour of, um, you know, the, the deal breaker being having an indoor for me. And I've, I've stated this publicly to the Premier League and the EFL. I think if you're committed and you have investment and you have the drive and energy over time and a budget with staff levels and you have the facilities we've got, which are fantastic currently, um, should it be that, you can't, that you're, you're indoor it is a deal breaker? I don't think so. Um, but that's an argument that's ongoing. And if that's what we have to do, then we have to do. I think we should be recognised and supported for the work that's gone on and the commitment from the board, the owner, um, management uh, and what we're doing internally. Rolling back the years, one player who you did attract to the club was Brett Pittman. He was probably one of your first real success stories. Just tell us a bit more about how he found his way to the club. Obviously, he's not from Bournemouth. No, he's not. Uh, he's a Jersey boy. Um, I can't actually remember how he directly come to my attention. I knew that Sheffield United and I think Man United and Southampton had um, been looking at him or were interested. Um, bizarrely, the current train ground we've got, which we've got eight pitches, which is great, and a show pitch, was then, I think, occupied by one local team. I think it was Brandsgore or something. And they, I think, used one and a half pitches. Uh, the training room, the changing rooms weren't the biggest. So constantly, we couldn't probably afford that capacity of ground. So Brett had his trial game against Oxford on what we call pitch four. And um, he'd been into training with me at Brockenhurst. And he obviously had certain attributes. Um, you know, he, when you look at him on the pitch, you know, we know what his nickname was. Um, you know, people's perception of him in terms of his pace, I think was wrong. Um, you know, he wasn't the smoothest mover uh, in some ways. Um, so, and I think he was very good at golf. He lived on an island, so that sort of vent island mentality, if he screws up, he screws up phrase. Um, we went through the training program and sort of, you know, and, and really, you know, when we were doing sessions, you know, finishing and everything else, not in question. I was just trying to maybe get into his head a little bit and just trying to maybe correct uh, some things if that was possible. And then we had the game at um, against Oxford. And I don't think he scored. Um, he did okay, in my opinion. Um, he probably didn't get the service that he needed at the time because I think he was on trial and the other guy, guys were all trying to get their own uh, sort of places in, 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 the, in the sort of environment, first team as well. And um, luckily, fortunately for us, as a club, given his record, we had a, a tour arranged for Jersey and we were due to play uh, a team, a, a senior team, can't remember who we play now, and then we were going to play Jersey under 18s. And I met his family, who were, who were lovely, um, and I said, look, I, I just haven't seen enough, um, but we've got this opportunity. I would have I would have brought him back, but we had the opportunity at Jersey, so it was on his homeland, in his homeland. So maybe it might have been a bit more settling from him. And he played and he scored four games in the first game against us, and every one of them was different. And then he played the next day, I think it was, for the 18s. Um, I think he scored one or two. And um, he come off because obviously he played the day before. And I looked to my left and looked to my right to the other staff and I went, I don't care what he does. He scores goals, so we're going to take him. And, you know, that was not any, not a difficult uh, decision because you look at a, a goalkeeper, uh, sorry, a, a goal scorer who can score from outside the box, 30 yards, inside the box, two yards, header, over a kick, diving header, free kicks. Um, at some point, not every player can tick every box. It's what you need him to tick. And he could tick the most important boxes, in my opinion. And uh, we worked with him. I mentioned him to Sean. And uh, Sean and Peter used to come down to the, the training ground. Uh, uh, well, sorry, Chapel Gate. to watch the games um, as much as they could. And at one game, I think he scored from 30 yards. He scored a free kick and he went, Phew. And he'd obviously seen a player himself, Sean, he knew a player, and he went, and then he went, right, okay. And I think, not in this order, but we played Exeter away. And I obviously, 
drove the minibus, as you do then. And I got a phone call on the way in the morning from Sean saying, we need Brett. And I went, well, I'm halfway to uh, Exeter. So I end up having to hand across the keys, um, well, not the keys, sorry, because I drove the bus, is, and I had to get him back, sharpish. And luckily we got back and I think he went on the bench. Um, and the next day I still told him to go to, uh, I don't know, the next day I think it was another game. He, you know, he went straight to education the next morning. But people have said to me, what, what did you do with Brett? in terms of your development. And I could be very blase and say, oh, I did this, did this, did this. I couldn't teach him to finish. I can only teach him to understand the environment and uh, just try and make sure that he kept, uh, not focus, that's the wrong word, but you know, his determination for other stuff was paramount because he's such a, a laid back character. He's like he is now then, you know, having a conversation where you, you almost have to engage with him. And the more you engage with him, the bigger the conversation is. Um, and so he, he hasn't changed in that respect uh, in many ways, but uh, as, you, as we all know, what great finisher. And obviously he proved a lot of people wrong about you know, his pace. I think it was a goal, goal out there when he's gone from the halfway, wherever it was when he's gone from the halfway line and left people in his wake. So he certainly could, uh, could utilize his, his, his attributes at the right time at the right moment. Bit disrespectful there of Zoe to uh, drop Brett's Sir title. Uh, Joe, Sir Brett Pittman, we like to call him. Um, he made his debut against Torquay in a League Cup in 2005, Joe. And like you've just said there, you know, someone else might have seen him in that Oxford game and thought, no, he's not for us. And, he, and, and you'd never seen him again. What goes through your mind when he steps out on that pitch and makes his debut? Show me something. Uh, if you're talking about the Oxford game. No, I'm or talking like, about making his first team oh, debut. Um, there's always going to be the worry. Um, there's always going to be what I know he can do and whether they can do it and how long... They're going to be in the manager's eyes because he could go on. You know, we could talk. I won't go talk about another play at the moment, but he could go on and make a couple of errors, and then very quickly he's not there. So you almost worry a little bit. Um, I probably get as uh, anxious uh, watching the players playing than probably, you know, managing myself on the sideline or in my own sort of uh, environment. Um, and then when something clicks, you know, the euphoria. For, for, for everybody, every, not just me, every member of staff that's working with the individuals. So, yeah, you just hope he does really well and you hope that he does what he can do. A couple more players. Sam Vokes, Josh McCoy, local lads, Limington boys. Sam was only 17 when Kevin Bond plucked him to make his debut against Nottingham Forest. Josh was also around at that time as well. Just massive feathers in the cap for the academy and the, and the staff. Again, I'll go back to the point I made earlier. When you look at their commitment and the commitment of the family, when you look at what we couldn't provide for them, um, for them to sign up to us, excuse me, and believe in what we were doing or I was saying we would do, and then to suddenly have the opportunity. I mean, excuse me, Sam, Sam was a really interesting one because at the time uh, we were slightly bereft of strikers and the members being in the uh, office with Kevin. Um, and talk, I think they were talking, but I think they were talking with Mike, Mike, might have been Mike at the time, Mike Cordy, or some, something about the recruitment of players and they'd mentioned somebody and then they obviously come to me and said, right, you know, who have we got in the wings? I had two strikers, one was Sam and one was another player uh, and they were talking about, you know, playing against Nottingham Forest out there in a the first team game. So the first thing that comes to mind is the point I make before, the anxiety, being anxious and that's, that's me watching them. So what are they going to be like? Who's the best fit? for the occasion. Sam was um, not laid back in a negative way, but he was very calm, how he did his business, uh, physically developed, uh, and I had a, a choice to make about between these two players. And I said to Kevin, in my opinion, given the occasion, um, this is what you'll get, um, and this is what you might not get, because obviously we have to consider his age and his stage of development. So. And if you, remember, if you remember, he went out there and I think the first three out of five movements, he slipped on his bum. Uh, and Kevin's looked at me and gone, what's he doing? And I went, right, I've got an idea, right? So when the halftime whistle went, I walked on the pitch, I went, have you got moulded boots on? And he went, yeah. I went, are you stupid? 
I said, you're playing a debut against Nottingham Forest on the first team pitch. And it was an evening game. So you got moulded on. And I repeatedly told the players, right, this is your footwear. This is what you wear. This is where you take, you're taking with you. And he changed his boots. And he did some good stuff. And then afterwards with the boots on, and I'm not saying he had, you know, the magic slippers, but he obviously impacted the game. And the rest, again, is sort of history. And I went up onto the pitch at the end of the game. I said, well done. I said, but you know, that could have been your last game. And I use that uh, uh, when I speak to other players about your preparation, your mindset, making sure you're ready. Because he clearly wasn't ready. I haven't said that his mindset was probably right. His mindset was right, but the toolbox, i.e. his boots, were not. And that could have changed history in many ways. Um, you know, he was one that uh, someone said to me, where do you think you'll end up playing? And, and I did make a statement at that time, in my opinion, and he surpassed that uh, conversation tenfold. You know, him seeing him with that flick header in the was like, we've got patio doors, luckily they were open, because I, I was out the doors around the garden and back in the house again, because <laughs> when you see someone like that as a coach, that just, you can work as long as you want in the industry, and particularly when you're talking about an environment that struggled like this did, to see that moment on national TV beamed across everywhere is just like, and you know, a great lad, great family. His brother was in, Matt, uh, who was under pressure because obviously Sam had done that well. I, met, I bumped into Matt the other, the other week, who was doing unbelievably well in, in a business, a uh, building, construction uh, thing. So, you know, there's another story of another player who's been here, but has had another fantastic opportunity through his career and focusing on his education. So, um, yeah, that was a story with, with Sam, you know, how it all sort of uh, come about and then obviously kept his sort of uh, theoretical position in the side. And, went to Wolves, didn't he, and moved on to Burnley. And he had a number of loans and some injuries. And and uh, I met him in Christchurch through the week. And uh, it's just like talking to them when they're 16, 17, but with a lot more smarter clothes on. So one player we have to talk about, Danny Ings. Tell us about him. Tell us about his development and tell us about, you know, how proud you are when you see him out there in the Premier League scoring all those goals. Well, he played for Liverpool for a start. So that's a good start. That's a good start. <laughs> uh, he's a really, really interesting one. You know, his dad, Shane, uh, had him coaching. You know, there's this conversation about he was released for Southampton and all that, whatever. Um, but I think he played for his dad's team. I think it was Netley or something like that. And he was obviously from Winchester area. And he'd come to our attention. Uh, I think he'd had some trials or been in the development centre of Southampton or something like that. And he, nonetheless, he'd come to our attention and... He come in, I think it was under 15s, and uh, uh, Derek Old uh, uh, brought him in. Uh, Brian O'Donnell, I mentioned, and, and a couple of other coaches. I think Jim Totchik and that worked with him uh, at the schoolboy ages. And very quickly, um, I obviously watched, uh, got reports from him, and got him over to work with us at Brockenairs because we had this under 16s used to come in on a day release at Brockenairs, so he worked in there. Uh, and I think he had a, a reserve team game uh, at some stage very early on. Uh, technically, for me, uh, the players I work with, with all due respect to all the players, he was probably one of the most technically proficient players I'd work with. Uh, as a young player, he was overzealous sometimes you know, with referees and uh, whatever, which is great. You know, shows a really enthusiasm and determination for the game and hunger, desire to do well. Um, he had, unfortunately, uh, you know, some injuries. But uh, there's, there's certain games, when I look back, I think there was a game we played against Millwall. And I'm thinking about when it got closer to decision time, we played Millwall, who then were a, a decent academy, good players. Uh, it was a friendly. And he played up front. Um, I think he put three of the Millwall players on the bum. Uh, scored a goal, uh, as he can do. And then, I don't know what happened, but I ended up having to play him in midfield. Um uh, and he slotted in there, looked like he could have played in midfield. And it was that moment when something happens, you know, he's got it. If he can adapt himself and apply himself in that moment, uh, and he can still produce the attributes that's required in that position, and he can do that. Um, you know, he's a, he's a 
uh, right foot to play, he's playing on the right hand side, but actually, I think in my opinion, he played uh, better on, on the left, and now he's found this sort of middle middle area as, as he's developed, like Adam Lallana has, to be fair. Uh, but character, attitude, uh, you know, he he struggled a little bit, the family struggled a little bit, if they don't mind me saying. You know, we, we had to support him with a, a council grant. Uh, I had to apply to the Hampshire Council for him to get a bursary. Um, we then had to do, try and find accommodation for him. And he was put into a, accommodation providers who, who lived in Highcliffe, uh, who he still has a great relationship with. Uh, you know, and uh, fortunately, I think the Liverpool fans as well, so that helps. Um, and the the injuries became a bit of an issue because clearly we just couldn't carry people over because of the finances at the time. And I had the conversation with Ed was the manager at the time. I said, look, we, ha we have to do something with them. Uh, we can't, we can't turn away. Ed hadn't seen a great deal of them because he'd been injured and whatever at the critical time. I said, look, we've got to do something. I said, look, hand on my hat, you've got to do something. So he said, okay, fine, we'll give him a three month contract. And uh, we'll, we'll ne he need to be playing games because we won't be playing around the first team. So we're going out to Dorchester, as you'll know. I suppose I wouldn't say the rest is history because he's, he's had a journey since then, but he certainly got games under his belt, certainly got goals under his belt. He got himself to a level of fitness again. He got match competitive, ready, and obviously he came back and uh, slotted in. And again, without using paraphrase, it's it sort of, sort of the, the rest is history, I suppose. Um, he was a really interesting character. Uh, I think there was a misquote some time ago, it might have been from you, Neil, that he was a bit of a nightmare. And I've always, I actually spoke to him about this because I felt really guilty because I thought, oh God, if that's gone out in the domain, will he think? And I didn't mean it in that way. It'd be like, a little bit like Sam, you know, where's your boots? And for me, it'd be like, Danny, where's your textbook? Where's your pencil? Because that might sound really bizarre coming from someone who's trying to coach players. But if I'm telling families and parents that the whole program is important, the players have to respond, they have to buy in. So they need to subscribe to the education program. Because if you don't, the college won't be doing it anymore. And then we will go back to the point you make, Zoe. We won't have a youth team program because where will we go? So I was a pain in the backside. Where's your pen? Where's your tutor book? And I was doing the MVQ program for them as well. So I had to mark stuff. Why haven't you done your stuff, Dan? And it was on and on and on. But if you're persistent, the penny drops. And I think if you spoke to you know, any manager that's worked with them, and I'll go back to Liverpool again. If you speak to Jürgen or Alex Inglethorpe or Neil Critchley at Liverpool, they will speak so highly of him um, when he's been injured and working with the young players and being a mentor. You know, he's done charity stuff. He's Again, I, I don't know what it is. I, I think maybe if I can be personal about myself, I think my military background and having been in different positions, different domains, working with different people who, are, who are obviously military, you, you, you can work people out and you can see things that maybe other people can't see innately and you you hope that will come to the table at some point and I think the players that we've mentioned at young ages who all want to be professional football players all think they are all have to still go through a journey and I think you've got to keep demanding and demanding them and make them resilient uh, because when they get in this in industry you know and he's uh, going back to Danny he's had other injuries at clubs and his resilience and robustness and bounceability is proven. And he's come back, and in some ways he's come back better. And, you know, that's all you can ask, because that is someone who's playing at an elite sportsman level that is competitive and honest, hard work and determined. And, you know, so, so pleased for him and his family that he's now reaping, you know, the other benefits of playing at the level he's playing. I wish I could misquote Danny Ings, Joe, because the last couple of times I tried to get hold of him, he's pied me. <laughs> um, but I do remember him being one of the most articulate 17-year-olds I'd ever interviewed when he was here, and it, it really took me took me by surprise how you know intelligent he was and what have you. But I was going to say, for every Danny Ings, for every Sam Vokes, there are hundreds, and I'm going to use the example of Carl Preston's, a, a lad who got his chance under Jimmy Quinn, and had Jimmy still been the manager for a longer period of time, probably would have made a lot of appearances and who knows what could have happened. But Jimmy lost his job. Eddie took over. Eddie obviously didn't fancy Carl. And then, as we know, Carl ends up Wessex League, whatever. 
that's a change of manager can affect academy players so much, Joe. Hundred percent, hundred percent. You know, if we talk about the present, you know, we've been fortunate to have the players we've had under the new management. The realities of the game is that uh, those opportunities, hopefully, are there. Can the players grasp them? I think the young players currently. And I'll come back to the point you make. The, the young players that have grasped that opportunity at the moment have, have definitely been in the manager's eye. You know, I met um, first team management. Uh, the other week, Matt Wells, and we had a really good long chat and he couldn't compliment the young players highly enough about not just their attributes, but their manner, you know, the, the way they go about the building. So, you know, it, they can be in and they can be out. Uh, Carl Preston, for me, the two games he played, I thought he did exceedingly well. Uh, I think one was Brentford. Um, the other one was, was it Port Vale, I think. Well, I but I, I'm not too sure. Uh, but he's a wide left player, uh, quick, direct, could beat people. Um, and okay, you know, that, that snapshot unfortunately got taken away uh, from Carl. I actually seen him quite a few months ago. It took me a while to recognise him because he'd grown up a bit. But uh, I, I, I've got to say at this point, I don't, I can t- hand on heart say every player I can remember, and if you want to tell me differently, please do. Every player that's gone out there and had a snapshot, if you want to call it, has, has done uh, well enough in my opinion. Not one of them, I think, I've looked and have gone, when you made the point about, you know, what you like sitting in the stand, not one sort of gone, <sighs> you know, and go back to Billy Franks, Matt Finley, Jamie Wiskin for that cameo appearance, Carl Preston, you know, all the other, all the other players have gone in there and have, they've done really well because they know what they're supposed to be doing. Tell me something, Joe, you come across as a nice guy. <laughs> What's it like to shatter a young player's dream by telling them there's no future for you here? Does that sort of thing get any easier? Um, it doesn't but it does if it makes sense because I speak to staff about there shouldn't within reason there shouldn't be uh, and, and let's not talk about the people who are in the first team or first team squads let's talk about the lads at 16s 18s or younger they should be in a process where they understand where they are and if we're honest enough that the family and in support of their young boy would be given them the feedback that when that time comes, there's almost a preparation for it. Uh, that is not always the case. There are stories of people being cajoled uh, and told they're doing really well, getting asked by families or the players asking, oh, you're doing really well, that's great, yeah, you don't worry about this. And suddenly they have a meeting and they say, well, unfortunately, we're not going to carry it forward. That shouldn't happen. That shouldn't happen. It might happen that that conversation that happens to be held in a changing room or else because that's the logistics of the thing, but we need to make sure we're honest um, and not get too close to uh, the parents because that event may very well happen at some stage. Um, and, yeah, that's all to say, but there are some... I mean, if, I don't know if you've seen the promo on BBC the other night about the agents and things like that, some about some of the stories of the players who've been promised something and then dropped and they're now not involved. You know, there is a big drop-off. We know that. But can we make that drop-off more transparent, more clear, and give them an opportunity to move to an so we, we, we when we had we've got the development centres at the moment, so we have an option of where we think we can they, we can place them. So there's a plan B. Um, certainly there's a plan B with the under 18s in terms of, you know, a scholarship in America or we send information out to all the clubs at a, a level or a level below us so that the family and the player knows we're trying to do the very best we can. And a lot of parents will accept the fact that they're, they're sensible enough to say, yeah, and I, I, we understand this. But we've had a fantastic journey. You know, we, we've had lads who've been released at 18. I use James Oliver, whose family were fantastic. He got released by Sheffield United, came to us, didn't get a development squad contract and he was going around the environment and the family wrote his letter probably a year after he'd gone. He still hasn't got a club and he couldn't compliment the staff, uh, the programme and how he's developed life skills because we need to make sure on top of what we said about releases, we're, we're, we're providing life skills for these people. Uh, more so obviously at 16 to 18 and above because they need to have another career. This year, obviously, Joe, under the new manager, we've seen plenty of young talent break into the first team. We can mention Jordan Zamora, Jaden Anthony, Gavin Kilkenny, Mark Travers in goal as number one. We've seen Zeno Ibsen Rossi in there too. 
for you, that must make you extremely proud to see players, some players that we've had from a young age, some players that we've only brought in from, from under 18s or under 21s, making that step up into the first team. No, I, I say, I think the story, uh, there's been a lot of negativity about academy football and the drop off and the percentage. And, you know, and I think when you look at those players, uh, uh, 11 that we had in the squad, um, two hadn't played academy football in uh, Mark Travers and Gavin they come from Southern Ireland and uh, six came from being released uh, either at one club two clubs or three clubs so that robustness or resilience to overcome that I think the most important thing for us was when they come in is, is to make sure they felt they were in an environment that they could trust because some of them might have been told of things that they didn't believe at the end that when they were getting released point you make before Neil about you know them getting dropped so I think we need to make sure when, we, when we're meeting the family and if they have got an agent, you know, this is what we do, this is why we do it, this is what we can provide. Uh, we'll be honest and we'll give them some evidence. For example, you know, if the parents are very keen because they've already been released, they see the perils of maybe not being in the game. Uh, education is going to be important. And we can identify that, you know, we've had this success, 100% education. Uh, we can provide an A-level at this level for us, which is difficult. Um, and you hope that the family take the opportunity. I think once they come in on trial and they, they work with the staff, they quickly realise that it's a safe environment and they can trust because we've got like an open door policy. We want players to be comfortable enough to talk. Um, quite a humble environment. Um, and then you hope with that there'll be an element of success and the success might be that they go from 16 to 18s and we have to say, you know, goodbye, or hopefully they move on to the development squad. Um, the the lottery is being in the first team. So the point I make is that, albeit there's lots of unfortunate stories, I think there'd be very few clubs that would have had the opportunity to have had that many players in the, the squad at the same time, under the manager's eye, been on tour, been looked at, been scrutinised, can certainly come up with the goods, and when called upon, I think the management team would say that they could rely on them. So collectively, from bringing them in through the recruitment process, educating them, coaching them, uh, developing them physically, you know, Christian was one that clearly needed to have more physical development in, into him. Zeno was injured twice, and the medical, the medical support and the rehabilitation for him and working in his head you know, meeting him when he's injured and talking to him about where he is and then for him to go to Hibernian and then come here and establish himself and Gary Cahill put him out to the team is not a bad substitution. Um, you know, I think the whole academy staff uh, are, are delighted. You know, I'm sure the board are delighted with the investment because those players now have put a marker in the, stand, in, in the sand. Um, and it was important that we, at this moment in time, uh, bring that point up because clearly, you know, the, the team, the, the club have to look at trying to get back in the Premier League and they have to recruit. Um, but the opportunity that the management team have given them is establish them. You mentioned before about parents and some of the players that we now see in the first team, people like Jordan Zamora, his trial game was for the under 21s, Gav Kilkenny, Mark Travers, you say he hadn't played academy football. When you're trying to lure them in, how much of it? is about trying to convince the family. You know, you, you talked earlier about James Oliver and how pivotal his family was. How much is it about trying to convince the family? And I mean, at this age, some of them even have agents as well. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it has to be that you're all around the table. And we tend to be, certainly when we brought, not those players, when we sign every player, but some of those players would have come in maybe just after the pre-season started. So we'd already had our meetings with our own players. And you, you they'd come into a room, they'd have myself, Alan, Carl Robson, um, whoever the medical person was at the time, because that's obviously changed. So Sarah or Jess or whatever. Um, and they'd have Dawn, um, and I think mentioned Carl Robson. So we'd have a, a table with all the key people in that were going to be involved in their, their journey. Um, and we'd obviously trial them by that time. And we were going to offer them. And quite a few of them probably would have had other offers. Some of them may be from a Cat 2, uh, having been a Cat 1 player. So it's a challenge to try and sit there and talk about what you think you can provide. 
But I say it's important that you're honest and, and they believe in what you're saying. And I think when they get around the table with those people, I think I would say that they would certainly listen to what we're saying. I think they would have had a good experience in the training environment. You know, that's also integrating with the players because the young players that we have also ensure that those players are integrated. So they feel comfortable. Bear in mind they've been released, which is a bit of a big drop. We have at the same time lost uh, players in that same position who've decided to go to a Cat 2, for example, because they want to play Cat 2 football, which is fine. So we haven't captured every player we'd like. And some of them, um, I won't particularly go into the individuals, but some of them have been, have been a longer burner to get here. And I'm talking now about the ones who are in the, in the squad now. They haven't just come in at 16 and suddenly at 18, they're in the first team. They've, they've still had to go through a journey. They've still had to they learn to be uh, resilient, robust. They've had to go on a loan experience. Some of them good or not so good. We've got current players on loan at the moment. So what you've got in front of you is, as a cat three, we can say, these are the players we've had on loan. These are the players we've had in the first team. These are the players that are currently training uh, with the 21s who are 16 or 17. These are the players that have been over training with the first team. So in every way that another bigger club can say this is what we do, as a cat three, we can show them the evidence. And I think it's easier by then to com convince to a degree uh, the players and parents, and then we need to make sure we keep in good communication with them. The communication before that point is also very tight. We're engaged with them, so it's not as if like we're just getting in on trial, you know, and, and then we'll see what happens. There's the communication back. So the parents already feel comfortable with the personalities that are going to be sat around the table. So it's not as if suddenly they don't know who, who Alan is or Dawn is or Carl. They've already had that contact. And I think that makes it a little bit easier. And don't get me wrong, we're not successful with everyone. Everyone doesn't sit around that table. Um, many of them we go, no. We've had some really good footballers that are probably in some ways, this might sound bizarre, better. But go back to the early points we said about what is it you see. If I see some I don't like, then I won't sign. Joe. Danny Ings, Sam Vokes, Josh McCoy, Sam Surridge, Bailey Cargill, all fairly local. And I know that we have local players in the academy ranks. I know a couple of guys who are in the non-league circle around here, their sons are involved, I won't name them, but Mark Travers, Gavin Kilkenny, Jaden Anthony, Jordan Zamora, Zeno, they're not local. You've had to cast your net wider in the last few years. Just sort of explain why you've done that. Allied to all the other things we've been talking about, you know, one of the areas where we ha had an issue was recruitment. Uh, and I remember meeting with, with senior members of the club that we said, you know, we need to have a better strategy. Um, so, you know, we only had local scouts. So would the club invest in some external contacts? Um, not at great cost, which we did. Uh, I, I said I wasn't going to mention names individually at staff in case I miss them, but as we're talking about that particular process, then... Carl Robson at the time was responsible for He became head of recruitment, turned his head away from some coaching stuff he did, totally focused on recruitment, built up a good relationship with people away from here, uh, you know, certainly particularly around London. Um, and I think once you get a player come in from either an agent or a club and they get looked after and they do well, then that club in itself then thinks Bournemouth are not bad. So you have a not just a scout, an agent, or a, a, a mate, you have a club that recognises what you're doing, you have an agent or you have a family, so you build up a wider network of maybe just people that are involved in football. And then you can use that example, as you're saying uh, before, Zoe, with when you talk about figures, stats, you're saying, well, you know, this, this player came in exactly the same stage as you, was released, look where he is now, this is what we've done, look at his education profile. Or this lad's come in, look at him now, you've talked about America, this lad's gone to the USA, he's, do, he's forged a career over there now, this one's earned a living. So you try and give them facts because it's important they look beyond the here and now because that's sometimes going to be the end of the journey. So we developed that network, if you like, um, and that's reaped, as you've mentioned there with the rollout of players, that's reaped huge benefits. And of course, there's been, you know, Gavin and um, Trav's come through a, a, another source indirectly, but that's another contact from someone had. So recruitment's all about contact, contact. You know, who knows who knows who, who knows who's, who's where. You know, it just, we, you know, we are, we're not, you know, all over the place as an academy. We're quite limited. On a similar theme to that one, Joe, Ajani Birchall, Remy Coddington, two players unearthed in Bermuda or on Bermuda. Now, I know that they've, they've left the club, and, but the club did recoup or, or certainly uh, benefited financially 
from their departures here. Just explain that link with Bermuda. That seems an odd one, if you like. Yeah. Well, I, what happens when I came after returning from the Premier League, uh, I obviously did a roots and branches sort of look at what we were doing and what we weren't doing, what, what I could implement, utilise. And at the time, we had a young player, a young goalkeeper in goal on trial. And I just inquired at who he was. And he said, oh, he's over. It was a half term. He's over in Bermuda. Um, I went, oh, okay. How was that worth? And he said, oh, one of the local scouts is Bermudan. Um, and he's got him over. We were, we, and they've had a couple of lads. Now, another lad come over who was in the uh, youth team on trial from Bermuda with Carl Fletcher and myself. And we were making a decision on whether, you know, we would take him or not. And I said, well, I'm not too sure. I said, and uh, I said, I'm not too sure how much he's done to this point. And then we just talked about Bermuda and they wanted to bring a group of players over, a younger group. I said, look, let's not wait. Is it not easier to go out there, have a look at the culture, have a look how they train? Um, and so... Um, Bermuda FA, we contacted and they said, yep, we can come out. Will you do a CPD and talk about Bournemouth, talk about coach education, about what you're doing and see whether we can develop a link. So uh, myself and this uh, scout um, who uh, lives locally, uh, Andy Powell, uh, he arranged the programme, I feel like, said, okay, we'll go. So we went over there for a week and people go, you went to Bermuda for a week. That's pretty, it was honestly really hard work. I had one day where I saw a beach which is the day before we flew back. We went round virtually all the teams, um, training, watching training, watching games, uh, did a presentation to Bermuda FA. And what was really interesting, it's strange over there because a lot of the clubs, like the, the sort of grassroots teams, all were isolated. It was all like rivalry type things, so they didn't actually collaborate very much. So it was all like disparate, you know, that's the right word. And uh, when we advertised the... Uh, the CPD, every club sent a representative, if not two or three. And the BMU and FA were like, wow. Because they, they wanted to gain information uh, and uh, be updated on some stuff. So they, they weren't too aware what it was going to be about. And it was really good. And then we went to uh, the BMU uh, uh, training environment, which was like an Astro on a, I don't know what day it was. And I was watching, it was an under, in fact, bizarrely, I think in this book, it's weird. In the spook, there were uh, an under-12 game. Uh, North Village were playing against one of the other teams. And there was a number 10 and a number 6 playing under-11s. And I just ha spotted them. And there was things they did, uh, you know, the athletic, um, really good manner, good characters over there. I found that out on my, my visit. If you've ever been to the Caribbean, and that's sort of the type of individual that lives there, I, I, I believe. I thought, oh, they look, they look not bad. And I just noted there, and this isn't prep for this, by the way. That's weird, I just remembered in this book. And um, the family, both families had an education background, a family member. And a lot of Bermudans tend to go to the USA to explore, you know, universities and play football. And the families decided to come to Bermuda uh, because there'd been a conversation via me, via whatever. And they went to the, the collegiate school. So they both went to the same school. And then we then tried to get them registered with us. Um, there was some red tape around, you know, the clearance stuff and everything else. Because I, I suppose from the league point of view, they looked at two players come from the same place to the same school, potentially the same club. Um, but it was just the way... You know, it happened that families wanted to get away. They didn't want to go to America, and they had this contact here and been in here anyway. And the fam some family members lived in the UK, um, so they made the choice to come across. So that's where it started. It was about basically me seeing what they did, so I could, if we got any other players coming across, I knew what level of training they were doing. I knew what level of game uh, tactical understanding they had. So when we were looking at going back to this midfield player, I could see potentially what they may be short of and whether we could provide that missing piece. That was the idea. So that's how it sort of uh, evolved. And uh, in terms of, you know, Remy and Ajani, um, you know, they progressed. Well, we had an opportunity to play. Remy left to go to West Ham. Ajani was a bit younger, a year younger. Um, and we, um, a couple of things happened actually. And, and football's all about opportunity and taking 
taking that opportunity and sometimes timing. You know, COVID stopped us bringing trialists in. There were some injuries. So in the 18s, we had the opportunity to, you know, play Ajani more often, um, you know, which normally didn't happen because we got quite a healthy bunch of under 18s. And Ajani played in the FA Youth Cup in the first half, did really well, probably the best player on the pitch. And there's quite a lot of scouts there. So they obviously recognise his talent. And as we said, you know, the sort of the rest is history. Well, Joe, it's been a, an absolute pleasure having you here with us today. We've really enjoyed your company and your stories. And fingers crossed we see plenty more academy graduates out there playing for the first team at Vitality Stadium. No, I'm delighted for the opportunity to be able to talk. And I, I hope that I portrayed the work that's been done in the academy by everybody, not me. Um, there's unbelie- honestly unbelievable staff there, uh, hugely supported by the club. So we're in a great pace, place uh, moving forward. And uh, so, yeah, I, I thank both of you for the time to be able to present this for you. Thank you. Now then, if you've enjoyed listening to our podcast, we would absolutely love it if you could like and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. We'd also be very grateful for any shares on social media so that other fans, be it AFC Bournemouth related or the general football fan, can enjoy it too. Our thanks again to Joe Roach and from Neil Perrett and myself, Zoe Rundle, thank you for tuning in to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. Thank you.